start. All right, so I'm Sean, and this is Introduction to Web Programming using PHP. So that'll be the programming language that we're using for learning web programming. Um, I will record every lesson to the best of my ability. Don't rely on those, though, because sometimes technical difficulties happen. That being said, though, I have three PHP classes uh, all together, so one of them through the week should likely get recorded, so there should definitely at least be one video ready for you. What I would recommend is after I post the first video, just subscribe to the channel. That way you can you know, keep up to date with all the videos that hit it. All right, it'll be on YouTube, obviously. Uh, all right, I guess we'll, uh, we'll dive into the only two slide decks you're ever going to have in this class because I don't like making them. They're really super annoying. Plus, people hate watching them. They're kind of they're boring. All right, this is uh, not the right two slide decks. Hold on. Do, do, do. Let's make sure we've got... Oh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Same information, just ignore the class that was listed there. So, that's me. Bold guy with glasses. I'm Sean. I'll be your teacher for the next 14 weeks. I've been programming for about 19 years. Actually, it's probably a little bit more than that, but I don't feel like dating myself. Um, I started with HTML, PHP, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, as many people do when they get into web programming. I've moved on from there. I primarily code in Ruby and in JavaScript in my day job. Uh, I work with several different databases from Mongo, DynamoDB, um, Postgres, a little bit of MySQL, not very much. I prefer Postgres over MySQL. Uh, you guys will be learning MySQL though. <coughs> I also know C++, Python, stuff like that. Kind of hit the point in my coding career where languages are just syntax. It's really just understanding the concepts of programming, and at that point, it's just documentation to be able to figure out how to actually code something in that language. Um, you guys will hit that point, too, at some point. Uh, yeah, so that's me in a nutshell for that part. My industry experience, I went to Georgian, just like you guys did. I graduated the W Band course in 2014, which is the web design and animation. We used to have like an animation component to it where you learned Flash, that dead program, very, very dead program. We learned it, and it was dead when we learned it. Um, but the main focus was actual web design. Uh, I was always more of a programmer than a web designer, so obviously I honed my skill sets more into programming. After that, I worked for G Shift Men Tent for about a year. Uh, then Fireside Agency did various freelance projects, and then now I'm back with G Shift Men Tent. They're here in Barrie, actually. Uh, we, how would I describe my job? We basically build tools for SEO agencies so that they can monitor their traffic, their campaigns, stuff like that. Uh, we scrape Google. That's essentially what we do. We scrape Google. I went to UOIT for a very, very brief moment uh, in time, about eight months, uh, but the math was annoying. Interestingly enough, though, your program actually bridges into the UOIT program. So if you decide after you're done college, you want to head off here and go start two years into your bachelor's degree at a university, you should think about UOIT. Uh, I took the game development course, hence the game. Um, but there's also information architecture and a whole bunch of other type of courses there as well that you can get into. Cool. Expectations. <clears throat> obviously be here, right? I will record the lessons, but like I said, they're not reliable. You get more when you're here than you do out of the recorded lessons, uh, especially with how much you pay to be here. You might as well come here and then you get one-on-one -on -one with me, plus also you get to interact with your colleagues and then any discussions, you can actually be a part of those discussions as well. Uh, it also ensures that I kind of learn who you are and get used to you. Um, I've gotten a few students, various jobs around the industry. I know quite a few different companies around the industry. So if you're looking for careers here in Barrie, um, definitely one of the people you should talk to. Uh, Rich Freeman as well, Scott McCrendel, people like that, people from the area. Unless you want to work in Toronto, which maybe some of you do. Uh, be on time. I always start two minutes into class. I feel like that's the exact amount of time it takes for people to like, even late people to arrive. Um, so I usually start about two minutes in. Uh, show dedication, prove your worth, blah, 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 right? Uh, participate. Uh, it's really boring to be up here for three hours and just talk to myself. Uh, so I do like feedback. If you see something that, you know, you maybe want to add to or anything like that, feel free to interrupt me and be happy to hear what you have to say. Also helps me learn and remember who you are. Starts to put a face to a name. 
that kind of thing. Plus, we will be doing group activities in this class, so it also helps other people kind of learn what you know and who you are as well. Uh, academic misconduct, probably one of the worst conversations I hate having. Um, they, uh, over the last five years, this has actually grown to be quite a problem. I tend to code things into my tests and stuff like that to help try to solve this type of issue. I run some smartware that actually will assess tests and tell me if two tests are similar, uh, stuff like that. So I don't recommend cheating in my class because I will likely catch you. Um, the big thing is just be legit. Don't plagiarize. Don't infringe copyright trademark. Uh, it tends to be embarrassing for everybody involved. Also, it's kind of bad form, right? Because it basically tells your colleagues the type of person you are. Um, it also reflects on the college in a negative light as well. If you're unclear to what is academic misconduct, please reach out to me and I will let you know. Um, I'm sure it's pretty obvious, right? Don't submit a teamwork's, or don't submit somebody else's work, obviously, as your own. Don't copy and paste a whole stack overflow question and submit that as work. Don't hire a fiver. I had somebody do that. Hire a contractor and submit their work. Um, just don't do that type of stuff. Cool. Uh, we don't need to go over that. Basically, the way I handle academic misconduct is I just zero out your thing that you submitted. Second time I catch you, I zero out your course, and I don't mark anything for you further. If you want to debate it, you can go to your contact, like to your coordinator, and discuss it with them. That's basically how I handle academic misconduct. Uh, cool. You can read through this stuff if you so choose. Due dates. Uh, I teach three PHP classes a week. I work a 40-hour job. I also volunteer at a local library in Aurelia teaching HTML. That starts in October. So I'm pretty busy. Um, however, I do make myself available to students through Slack. Uh, there'll be a Slack invite link that you are welcome to join. It is the quickest, fastest way to get a hold of me at any point. I usually respond usually within like two to three minutes of when somebody actually texts me because it goes to my tablet, my, my computer, my work computer, my phone. I literally get it everywhere. It is definitely faster than email. Email, I am slow at. Plus, sometimes the college changes my password. They don't give us any notification. And all of a sudden, my whole email system goes dead for a while until I finally realize that I'm not actually getting any emails. So it's definitely the fastest way to reach me. Uh, that being said, when it comes to actual due dates, I don't mind giving extensions, but I usually like to know where you're at inside your project. If you haven't even started your project and you're asking me for an extension on your due date, that's no. But if you show me that you've got some stuff done, you've made some progress, and you're just running a little bit behind, then I have usually no problem extending the due date. I also monitor the class, too. Like If I find that we're kind of moving a little too slow and maybe there's core concepts that you need to know in order to complete your project or assignment successfully, then I will tend to extend the due date on my own as well. All right. Most of our uh, most of our code will be handed in. Actually, 100% of our code will be handed in through something known as GitHub. How many of you are familiar with GitHub? Okay, so a few of you. <coughs> most of our code will be submitted through GitHub, which, at the end of the day, you submit your project. Make sure the submission link is in the uh, Blackboard, and then if you need to push till I mark, you push till I mark, and then once I mark it, that's it. It's written in stone. So that's something you can also rely on too. Cool. Any questions about extensions or due dates? No? Awesome. <coughs> Submissions, uh, you'll be submitting to Blackboard. Um, yeah, this is not completely accurate. You'll be submitting your GitHub link to Blackboard, basically, is what will happen. So all your code will be pushed to Blackboard. You'll submit your GitHub link to uh, me through Blackboard. Or sorry, your code will be submitted to uh, GitHub. I have a cold, so my head's kind of a little bit clustered. Um, in addition to that, anything, there's only one project that I can think of, or only one project component I can think of, that you may have to submit either a Dropbox link or actually upload it to Blackboard, and that's a small written submission or a presentation. Uh, that's the only piece I can think of. Everything else will be code-based and can just live in Blackboard, or live in GitHub. <clears throat> the project we'll be doing in this class is kind of cool. Uh, you won't have labs, and you won't have assignments. You only have one project. The project is broken into six components, so it will be handed in in six different parts. So uh, every few weeks, you'll hand in a part. 
of your project. The cool thing about that is you, my projects are open-ended as well, so it's basically you create what you want to create, as long as it contains the main components that are required. Which means you can actually go ahead and take advantage of that time to learn new concepts, learn things outside the box that you want to know, uh, instead of being confined to a specific project outline. Uh, the cool thing about that too is it means you don't wind up having to do replicated work, so you're not you know, doing an assignment and a lab and a project literally all on the same thing. You're doing one project that encompasses an idea, right? Each part will encompass an idea. Uh, the final piece to that project, the last week of that project, will be either a presentation or a write-up about your project. I leave it open like that because I know some people are not big on public speaking, so totally up to you. If you want to do the presentation side, you can do that. Uh, if you would rather do the write-up, you can do that. Even though I say group work, that is completely optional. You don't have to work in groups. I know some of you work. I know some of you don't live in Barrie. And you're commuting back and forth to Toronto. So actually making yourself available to a group is just stressful. That's totally fine if you want to do it on your own. The work is definitely completable by one individual. It's not like it's an over amount of work. That being said, though, I do put a little higher expectation on those of groups. Uh, the group size is up to four people. So obviously, if there's four people in your group, I expect a little bit more of a wow factor than you know one person doing the whole project by themselves, right? So keep that in mind. Uh, the agenda for the average class. Basically, I'll start sign-ins next week, not this week, so don't worry about that. Um, we'll do a previous class review. There'll always be a quiz in every single class. There'll be 12 of them all together. The total marks for quizzes for the semester are 10%, but you can achieve 12% by doing every single one of them. Uh, you have a full 24 hours? Yeah, full 24 hours to complete them. They open at 9 p.m. tonight. They are due by 11 p.m. or sorry, 12 p.m. tomorrow night. So as long as you get them done before that point, it's totally fine. You get two attempts, which is pretty cool. Um, but you have 10 minutes, <laughs> and then it force closes. So you have 10 minutes to complete it. There'll never be more than 10 questions, ever, at any point. They'll always be pretty small. Uh, so they should be able to be completed, you know, relatively quickly. Hopefully there'll be time in class to actually do the completion for them as well. Uh, also, we'll talk about the day's agenda, what we're going to actually learn that day. All of our lessons will be interactive, so me coding, teaching you a concept, you guys coding along with me, us engaging, talking, you know, troubleshooting, whatever it is that we need to do. Uh, hopefully we will get some in-class project support. I will aim for that to try to keep the classes thin enough that we can actually do some project support. And then two breaks as needed. I'm trying to keep them to 20 minutes. I used to do 15 minute breaks, but it was just too long and we were running out of time. So now I do 10 minute breaks and then if we have enough time at the end of the night, we just end early and then we just go home early because you guys are here till 10 o'clock, which is super late. Um, yeah, do you have only this? Class is a 10 o'clock class, or do you guys have other classes that end at 10? Just, yeah, yeah. I don't know why the college is going so late. Probably so many part-time instructors that so we have jobs, so yeah. Kind of sucks. Communicating with me. Number one way to communicate with me is Slack, okay? Um, very easy to join, common industry tool, so it's worthwhile for you to know. Uh, we use it at my job. We use it at Georgian College here. I've used it at every other job I've ever had. Um, so it's definitely a tool that you should become familiar with. Once you signed up to Slack, you can actually join multiple workspaces, that's what they're called. Uh, so if you get a job outside of Georgian, say for your co-op for next semester, and they use Slack, you just add it as a new workspace. You don't have to create a whole brand new account or anything like that. You just keep adding those workspaces. The other benefits, I'm doing something a little different with the Slack this time around. Uh, there's another teacher here, Chris Naismith. He teaches Advanced Mean Stack. And him and I are using the same Slack board. And as we meet teachers, we're pushing them into the same Slack board as well. So the idea is that you join one workspace, and hopefully all your teachers are in the same workspace. The other benefit is because Chris and I both teach multiple different classes. I teach PHP. I've taught MernStack. I've taught um, Bitmap and Vector. I've taught a whole bunch of different classes. Um, if you have any questions about your classes, you should be able to just post them in the general channel. And somebody should be able to help you, even if it's not your instructor. All right? So that's one good reason. Uh, these are the schedules of when I'm going to be here. 
I will be here on Mondays from seven to, or six to seven. I'll be here Tuesdays six to seven and Wednesdays. This is actually already on Blackboard under the course information with the actual times and the classroom. I realize this does not reflect that. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm all over the school. I'm not necessarily in one specific class. Um, but yeah, you can meet me at any of those times if you need to. Most science people don't usually need to. I've never really had a student that needed to meet me outside of class. But just keep that in mind. Uh, cool. Or email. That's your last resort. Email me. The last thing you do is email. Okay. <laughs> Course syllabus. Cool. We made it through a slide deck in like 20 minutes flat. Nice. Let's talk about the course syllabus. All right, I need to reflect. Hopefully my recording software is still recording this properly. Cool, if you want to follow along, um, this is an application that I've built that your course lesson plans will be put into. Uh, you can actually follow along with me if you go to your Blackboard shell go into your actual thing and go to weekly learning. Plus it will tell me that I actually uploaded to the correct people. Can you guys see this? Michelle? Cool. Awesome. So if you click on lesson one, at the very top you'll see lesson plan, introducing web programming and PHP syntax part one. You click that, that will open this page. I kind of like this because I can edit it as I find mistakes and go through it so you always get an up-to-date document. Cool. So we already did the who is class etiquette. Obviously, don't talk when I'm talking, that kind of thing, right? Or when other people are talking. Um, we talked about misconduct, all of those. Cool. Over the next 14 weeks, what we're going to do. So today, we're going to obviously introduce the course. Might do a little bit of PHP syntax. On Thursday or Wednesday of last week, we built uh, an index page just to index our files in lesson one. That's about all we got to by the time the day, the day was done. Uh, what else are we going to do? Next week we're going to do syntax and an HTML review. Uh, anybody here not take the HTML class prior to this one? Good. So we're going to review forms, creating a form, and we're going to submit it, but we're going to use PHP on the back end to actually handle the form. So you'll get to do that next week. The third week we're going to start getting into something called CRUD. Does anybody know what CRUD means? Create, read, yeah? Create, uh, read, update, delete. Exactly. Create, read, update, and delete. That's basically the four components of most web programming that you're going to deal with. Most of the classes you're going to take, whether it's this class, will encompass CRUD. When you take ASP.NET, you'll still be doing CRUD. When you take the MERN stack, you'll be doing CRUD. You'll be doing CRUD quite a bit through your college career. So understanding that it's create, read, update, and delete, that's data, right? That's working with data. Um, is a good comprehension, it's a good paradigm to understand. So next week we're actually going to start with that, not next week, sorry, the following week, we're going to start by doing the first pieces, which is create and read. So we're going to capture some data and we're going to write it to a database. Okay, and we'll talk about that then. Uh, the following week we're going to talk about input validation and basic authentication. So input validation is obviously validating the information you get from your user through your form. And then authentication is like password hashing and salting and all those type of things. Uh, the fifth week we're going to do editing and deleting or updating and deleting. Uh, so that'll be the last two pieces of the CRUD. Number six, uh, we'll be doing deployment. So you guys will actually learn how to take your, your stuff that you've built and actually push it to Heroku and have it live on the internet. So we'll use Heroku. You can use Azure. I know some of you have Azure accounts. Um, that's totally fine. I prefer Heroku over Azure just because of the concurrent connection issues that I've had with Azure before. Uh, issues where if I have a whole class of like 40 people and you all try to connect to the database at the same time because it dumps you on the same node, like 25 of you get no connection issue. <laughs> so I don't get that with Heroku, so I tend to use Heroku. Plus Heroku is a pretty big industry name. Learning how to use them is, is uh, definitely beneficial to you and it's super easy. Like, super, super easy. Um, cool. Then the midterm, obviously. Midterm will be broken into two pieces. There'll be a theory-based part and a practical-based part. The theory-based part will be 5%. The practical base will be 10% of your final grade. Okay? Uh, cool. Classes and error handling will be week eight. 
That's important for us to learn because you guys are going to learn to build your own model view controller system. So you'll learn the MVC um, paradigm, the design pattern. The reason why that is, I don't generally do that with web students, but I do that with programming students because learning design patterns is important for you guys as you head into your programming career. MVC is definitely one of the biggest design patterns that are out there. Plus, it's a huge benefit to you when you go into ASP.NET next year, right? Because you're going to be learning MVC. Now you will fully understand how, a, how MVC works under the hood because the concepts are the same despite the language you're working in. And then also when you start in the MERN stack, you'll also be learning MVC there as well. You might likely have me from the MERN stack. Um, and having that fundamental basis will definitely be helpful. Cool. Uh, so after that, we're going to learn to create a router and a render, and it's totally cool that you don't know what that is yet. Uh, we're going to learn to work with models, which is basically a way of taking your data and turning them into objects. And then last, if we get to it, which we might not, because you guys have, let's see, you're off for orientation, and then you're off for Thanksgiving, so you lose a class, right? So I tend to put one filler class at the end, that's search, filter, and sort data. If we don't get to it, what I'll do is I'll introduce you guys to something called ListJS. Take like 10 minutes to put it in, and you will have search, filter, and sort data, but with the JavaScript library. Cool. Any questions about the next 14 weeks? No? Awesome. Just hit you with a knowledge stick. Just, just club you with a knowledge stick. All right, let's do, uh, actually, before we do the web programming and PHP introduction, let's talk about our example project. So the way I teach, I'm sure most instructors do this the same way. Over the next 14 weeks, you do like little examples inside class, right? And you build onto something. Some instructors will do just one-offs where each class will be one-off of, an, of a, uh, like an interactive lecture. I'm going to actually work with you and we're gonna build you a portfolio piece that you can actually then submit on your co-op in order to help uh, co-op employers be able to know who you are. So basically a portfolio piece for you, right? So that's what we're going to do over the next 14 weeks. We're going to build a portfolio uh, using PHP as our back end. Uh, by the time we're done, it'll be a full model view controller system with your whole portfolio uh, dynamically editable by you that you can then add to your skill sets, add to your content as the weeks go on uh, or as you progress in your career or dump the whole thing and switch to something else later. <laughs> depending on what you want to do. So that'll be our, basically our example project that we'll be doing over the next 14 weeks. The gradables, there will be 12 in-class quizzes that'll equal out to 12%. Five group project parts, those will be coding based. Uh, one presentation slash write-up, so it's either a presentation or a write-up, not both. Uh, two major tests, just the midterm and the final. And then bonus marks. So I always award bonus marks when I see out-of-the-box thinking. So when it's a concept that I haven't taught and you've implemented some sort of crazy cool thing, I tend to award bonus marks when I catch those, uh, usually up to 10% of the course. So the max you can end a course with is 100% on Banner. Like you can get 110% in a course, but the max that can be written to Banner is 100%. You can't like overflow it to your communications classes or anything like that. Um, but you can easily get 100% in this class. It's not unachievable. Cool. Any questions about the gradables? No? Awesome. So group work, pretty easy. All participants in a group must submit a copy. I've tried to use Blackboard groups, and they suck, and I refuse to use them now. So all members must submit uh, the GitHub link. It's just a GitHub link. It's not a big deal. Uh, also, you must submit a group member review. I have a ten, I've seen in the past groups that, you know, they work together, there's like four people, but one person just never showed up, never did anything, never contributed, and yet all four get this wonderful mark, right? And it feels a little unfair. So with the anonymous group member review, when you submit your GitHub link, you just submit a little review. Nobody sees it except for me, and then I can change their grade based on that review. Um, also, a readme specifying each member involved in the work. So I need a readme file that just tells me all the group members. Actually, I don't need that if you submit the review, because it should be in the review anyways. Uh, a maximum of four group members is permitted. You can't combine two groups to create eight. <laughs> it has to be only groups of four. Uh, and a Google Doc will be provided. That sounds like me being overzealous. 
there will probably not be a Google Doc meeting for Friday. Um, what I will do, though, is I will, in uh, project part one, I'll kind of expect um, a little write-up just basically saying what you're going to be doing for your project. Um, and then we can go from there, just so I have an idea of what you're doing. So project part one will probably be pretty easy. Cool. Any questions? No? All right. You guys are super, super quiet. That's, uh, is this it? Awesome. Like I said, I'm not a massive fan of slide decks, so this will be the only one we have. Because I kind of hate them. They just take a long time to build, and nobody really cares about them, right? All right, cool. Introduction to web programming. A little sub title down there should be using PHP. Obviously, web programming is encompassed by many languages, not just PHP. However, PHP is kind of a heavy hitter. It makes up currently, believe it or not, you might call bullshit on me, but it does make up 80% of the internet right now, PHP. That is a massive amount based on that. Yeah. It should. And I'll switch back over to the mirror. Do, do, do. Under week learning, under the introduction, there'll be either PowerPoint, which will be a PowerPoint file that you can open through Microsoft, or you can open the slides.pdf. Yeah. The PowerPoint's better because it actually gives you my present presenter notes as well, so you can actually see what I'm talking about there. Uh, the PDF will just be the slides themselves. Nope, that's wrong. I want to extend. All right. So like I was saying, web programming, not encapsulated to just PHP, but the college prefers you guys to learn PHP as one of the first classes. Part of the reason being because it's super easy to learn. It's not a difficult language. You guys have worked in compiled languages. Uh, you guys did Java. Have you done any other languages? in the college other than Java, or has it just been Java? Just Java? Yeah. So Java's a bit different, right? Because you write your code, and then you have to compile it, and then you can execute it, right? Whereas PHP, it's known as an interpretive language, which means you don't compile it at all. It actually gets read line by line by line by the interpreter, and it spits out your program. That means you don't have to take care of a compiler. You don't have to make sure all these libraries are included. You don't have to go through all these other steps. All you need to do is make sure that your environment can actually interpret it, which we're going to use a super easy tool to do that with, uh, known as an XAMPP, and that'll make it super easy for you guys to actually code, which means you can hit the ground running. Um, hold on, I missed a slide. So <laughs> the goal is, is not only just to teach you how to program in PHP, obviously that's the side effect. The actual goal is to help you understand how the web works, what happens to an actual request when a user types something into the address bar, where, where is that going, where is the end point, right? How, what is the difference between a client and a server and those type of questions? Because web programming is a bit of a different beast than Java, right? Java, you're building an applet, you're putting it on your, your, your desktop, and it's something that you can interact with as a program. If you want to share that with somebody else, you just need to provide them the applet, and they can execute it. Web programming, it exists in the worldwide cloud, right? So everything's in the cloud, and it's accessible by the entire world, regardless of if they have Java installed or not, right? They don't need Java. They just need a client, and a client boils down to a browser. Steam, like, you know, little Steam client, that's a client. It's actually a web client. Uh, Origin is a web client. All those different little things. Even the PSN view that you see on your PlayStation is a web interface. So all those are web interfaces, and that's what we're going to learn to be able to build in this class. <clears throat> so the goal is to stop seeing the web as a user and actually start seeing the web as a developer, right? We all type our addresses into the bar, go to you know, zoodle.com or whatever we're going to go to, and we just consume whatever it is that we're looking at. Well, now you'll be able to actually look at it and be like, cool, how did you do that? How did you make that little slider send the pictures back and forth on that carousel, you know? 
How did you get it so that when I clicked, it opened up this little fading drop down? How did you do those things? And that's the questions that you're going to want to ask when you're done this class, because if you want to develop for the web, you're going to want to be able to solve those problems. <clears throat> when we think about users, and I tend to kind of hate on the user a little bit. I try not to. I'm trying to get better. I understand that they pay my salary, but at the end of the day, um, they can be unbearable. Uh, when we think of the user, we think of what is it the user that they gain from this particular thing. Right, like for example, a user's gonna enjoy McDonald's, they're gonna have their burger, their, their fries, and their pop, and they enjoy this wonderful thing. But the developer, the developer has to see this more as a creation. How do I actually make those fries? How do I, what tools do I need to be able to create this meal, right? That's our developer. When we think of a user, we also think of things like you know, enjoying the Sistine Chapel, right? Big, beautiful cathedral with huge painted ceiling. Absolutely gorgeous place to go. I've never been there. I would love to go. Um, very cool, right? Does anybody know who the developer of the Sistine Chapel ceiling was? Or the painter? No? Really? It's Michelangelo, right? Michelangelo, famous old dude. Michelangelo, right? <laughs> Super... Maybe not that guy, probably more this guy, right? Users, users love different things. Users will actually partake in a little bit of the development process, right? Users like to tell you how they want something designed, right? And it's funny because the user becomes the expert, even though they're not. They will become the expert on how they want something done, especially in web, it happens quite a bit. So, you know, you get the user and the user's like, hey, I think mullets are coming back. <laughs> and I want a mullet. I want a mullet more than anything. That's the user. He's telling you the design process, right? And many developers will probably keep telling him no, but the user will keep going to developer after developer after developer till he finds the right people for the job to actually make his mullet a real thing, right? So that teaches us kind of the idea of when we're a developer, we do have to be flexible with our users. It's okay for us to educate them, but we definitely want to be flexible on what we actually do, even if we hate what they want. All right, so user versus the developer. When a user sees a list of options on a website, they see it as a drop down with these multiple little option pieces. When we see it, and especially you now that you've taken the HTML course, you'll recognize this wonderful select box as being what's responsible for creating that drop down. As your career continues, you're going to start to see things like a Google header, right? And people will be like, oh yeah, look, it's a Google header, right? It's just a big picture. But it isn't. It actually involves so many different pieces, like all of these wonderful CSS styles, an onloader that happens with JavaScript. Not to mention all the pieces that are going to happen in the background as well, such as the CSS external that's loading, media queries that have to deal when the person resizes the screen, Stuff like that. It's a lot more than just a Google image. There's actually a lot more care that has to be put into it when they actually figure that out. Carousels. Carousels are fantastic. They look beautiful. This one's a light box. It's super awesome. You click on this image and this image will grow, right? And then you can see it and you click it again and it disappears back down. You load in images and they do this wonderful tiling effect. Oh my God. It's beautiful. But the amount of stuff you have to do as a developer in the back end, where you've got HTML5 to make sure that they have some search engine optimization on their pictures, using a photo swipe library because, I mean, coding that raw would be painful. You're using MySQL because they need a place to be able to, be able to actually store their image sources. Uh, you might be using Amazon Web Services because you can store the image link there in MySQL, but the image itself has to exist somewhere, so off to S3 we go. And then, you know, CSS3, right? Or cascading style sheets in order to actually align those things to where they actually need to be. There's a lot to actually just building a carousel. So why web development? Why would we choose web applications over desktop applications? This is passe. I mean, this was written four years ago. I don't think this is a big deal anymore. I don't think this is a confusion that you guys would suffer with, especially with how much you use the web, right? And like I said, you know, four years ago, we did have Steam, right? How many have Steam? I imagine most of you have Steam, right? Steam is a library for your games. 
That interface that you work in in Steam is actually web-based. It's entirely web-based. It's using HTML and JavaScript in the background. They do that because it's so quick to quickly do design changes or updates that they need to do. They can sync it up to a database, right? Pull in any game information that they need from the database. When you use Steam um, Remote Play, where you're actually streaming over your internet, that's using web technologies and able to stream your game through your network and to your TV, whenever you do that, your tablet, your smartphone, or whatever you're doing. When you use PS Now, right? And you're actually playing with games that you don't own in your library, but exist on their servers, servers a computer, and it's serving all that information over WebSockets or whatever its transfer protocol is, but it's web technologies that it's using in order to provide you that game and that experience that you're going to have, right? <laughs> so how does the web actually work, right? We're so used to using the web, we type the address in the address bar, but how does it actually work? Well, we have a very broad spectrum on actually what occurs. We have two types of websites that we will interact with in our day to day. Though this site is becoming less and less, uh, definitely the dy dynamic site is becoming a more prevalent one. Static website basically means that everything is hard coded, nothing is gonna change, if you want to update it, you actually have to pull the code open and update the code like physically. Um, it's no database connection. There's nothing else to it. It's just static, right? So when it comes to a static website, basically the way it works is the user will make a request to a website using one of their internet browsers, right? However they're going to do that. Or maybe they're doing it in SteamOS or something like that. Whatever. They're using an internet-based browser and they make a request. The request then gets sent to the server, right? So that wonderful address you have, there's a few steps in the middle there. Uh, basically, the address has to be converted into something known as an IP. The IP is the actual address of where that server is located, goes through a bunch of lookups, and then eventually arrives here where your code exists. The server then evaluates what you're asking for. So when you're looking for something like index.html, it's like, cool, let me see if I've got that. It's gonna go into its folder system, just like exactly the same folder system that exists on your computer. Goes into the folder system, and it looks for a file. It looks for the file called index.html. That's literally what it's doing. If it finds the file, it grabs it, pulls it back, and sends index.html off to the browser. So it returns back. Index.html, not parsed by the server. The server's total responsibility is to take index.html and just return it back to the client. Whatever the client has asked for, that's what the server is going to return. What actually will parse index.html is the browser. The browser will actually render it. The browser is quite capable. It will render a few different things. It can render HTML. It can render text. It can render PDFs images, right? It can actually parse and render SVGs, which are like uh, scalable vector graphics. Uh, it can also read VB script, which is really random, and JavaScript, right? Those are the things it's capable of actually rendering and parsing. Can't parse PHP though. Can't parse Ruby, can't parse Python, no Java, nothing like that. Can't do any of those wonderful things. But for a static website, we don't care. The only things we're going to deliver with a static website will be your index.html and your images. That's it, right? And the JavaScript or whatever else. So it lets the browser do what it needs to do. <laughs> Dynamic website, little different. Dynamic websites is when we want the user to be able to change their experience, right? Or maybe we want something else to change the experience. Maybe the time of day should change the experience, right? Maybe the background, depending on the time of the day, should turn from dawn to dusk, right? That kind of thing. You want to be able to create a web experience that is personal to whatever the actual audience is that you're trying to reach, right? So the starter, same group of people making a new request. Maybe they're requesting to Amazon, right? The request gets sent off to the server just the same way as the other one did, only this time when the server takes a look at it, it's going to evaluate the request of what they're looking for, and it's going to assess that, oh, you're looking for index.php. 
Okay. Well, I need to actually find on my system something to interpret that file and load it for you because the browser doesn't understand PHP. So I can't give it to the browser. So I need to interpret it, parse it, and send the browser something it understands. So it loads up one of its transpilers, right? Whether it's going to parse it through Python, whatever the heck camel is, Ruby, that's Python, that's Golang, sorry. <laughs> PHP, JSP, ASP.NET, right? What, what, no, it doesn't matter what it's going to use, it needs to do those things, right? If it has to do compilation step, it'll do the compilation step. But the server is responsible for taking whatever you're requesting and converting it into something the browser is going to understand. We're not done there though, because when you actually make your request, these server side languages are gonna parse through your script. And your script might do different things. It might load information from files, might load information from a database, right? Which is what we'll be learning in this class, how to grab data from the database. And it might even load information from an email box. I had to do that, that was very painful. But either way, you might be having sources of data coming from multiple different sources. It takes all that information combines it into its page, parses it all, and then transmits it back to the user as something the user can actually understand. Raw HTML, raw images, raw vector graphics, stuff that the actual browser comprehends. <clears throat> so when we look at static data and dynamic data, it's important to understand how the two actually differ. So static, that's data or content that's actually entered directly into your HTML page. It's hard-coded right into the page itself, right? Whereas dynamic, we use different sources of data to actually put together our page, right? So we'll reach out to a database, an API, a file system, an email box. doesn't matter. We'll reach out to different sources and actually build out the page for that user. Static, everyone gets the same content. Never changes. Doesn't matter if I access it, you access it, doesn't matter who accesses it, everybody gets the same data. It's not different for them, right? Whereas with dynamic, me signing into Amazon, my Amazon's gonna look different than your Amazon because it's based on things I bought, right? Or my Facebook is not gonna look like your Facebook. Imagine if we all had the same friends, right? That would be kind of weird. So they are different. They're made different because they're made personal to you. Data content on a static website, can only be like changed or modified using client-side scripting or actually having access to the server to change the data, right? So client-side scripting would be like JavaScript. You could go through with JavaScript and like change the data and that type of thing, but it won't stay. It won't stick. And the reason, and it won't be affected to, like it won't affect any other user. Like if you modify a color on the page, another user that visits that website will just see the original color that was there. And that's because the browser is stateless. It doesn't actually take a snapshot of the changes you've made because there's nothing to keep track of that. There's nothing to store that information. Whereas with a dynamic website, that information can be encapsulated. It can be stored into a database. It can be stored through an API call to another form. It can be done through S3 or whatever it is that you want to do. Either way, you can capture the changes. You can capture the data and then deliver them as a change, right? And then user input, often it's sanitized by the client, right? It's validation that happens on the, on the front end. So when you type in a form and you've done something wrong and you hit submit and it says, nope, this field is required, before it takes you anywhere else, it says this field is required. The thing that's responsible for that is JavaScript, right? It's JavaScript that's tapping into that, evaluating the form before it goes anywhere else to help you, it's really just a user experience piece. That's all it is. It actually has no merit whatsoever. It's not going to change anything. It doesn't stop hackers. It's not gonna stop bots or sniffers. It's not gonna stop me from scraping. It's not gonna stop any of that stuff because at the end of the day, it's only in the client. When you actually submit that form and you finally make it to the back end, that's where dynamic takes into play where we have to actually validate, sanitize, and normalize data that we receive from the user, right? Super important step for us, but we'll be looking at that in a couple weeks. <clears throat> so I keep mentioning data, so what is data, right? 
What is it actually when we use it? So when you think about things like Facebook, right? Think about the pieces of data that are on your Facebook. You have your name, right? Your friends list. All of that is data that you're consuming through Facebook, right? All of your likes, all of your statuses, any page updates that you actually create, um, any images you may add, any videos, anything you add to your stories, anything like that, that's all data that's dynamic that gets stored into a database that then Facebook retrieves using PHP. That's like their language of choice. Their front end is mainly powered by another framework known as React. How many of you have heard of React? No? You will. <laughs> React is a big framework that's powered uh, using JavaScript, and they made it. So that's their front end. Facebook, big dynamic site. Many people use it. Um, but we don't even have to just talk about Facebook. Look at Instagram, right? Same idea. Your stories, your images, all of that is dynamic data that's stored in a database. Uh, Snapchat, same thing. Doesn't matter if you take that picture and you think it's going away. It's not. <laughs> it's the internet. It's not. It's always there. All those things are stored data, right? Amazon, same idea. Could you imagine if they had to statically enter every single product they own? That would be unbearable. Every time they get new products, they have to go and update the inventory, and then you buy something, you son of a... Now he's got to go back and change the quantity that's available. <laughs> like... <laughs> That would be nuts, right? So obviously dynamic data, we retrieve that information from a database. We can do counts. We can take a look at different things. You can filter, right? You can be like, yeah, I want a t-shirt, but I want it in pink. So you can actually filter down by colors and stuff like that. And all of that is done because of dynamic data. <clears throat> We're not doing that. This is kind of a very boring look thing. Never mind. Let's escape from that. <laughs> All right, why don't we take one of those nice 10 minute breaks. You can like mellow your brains out. When you come back, what we'll do is we'll actually install some tools that we're gonna need for our environment sets up. Uh, yeah, let's uh, just meet back at 8.05. Let's call it 8.05. So this part um, always takes a bit of time because it's tool installations, right? So I've clocked out 45 minutes for us to install all the tools we need to install. But we'll do that in a second. Just before we do that, I just want to point out where you can find different resources. As I find different helpful things, I tend to put them into our um, Blackboard interface. And you'll notice there's an option called resources in there. If you click on it, you'll see right at the top is the Slack invite that I was talking about. That's how you would join Slack. Uh, there's the download for XAMPP, uh, VS Code, which is an IDE, which stands for Interactive Development Environment. So in Java, you use NetBeans. In HTML, I think Scott's a big Atom user. Um, so you probably used Atom. I tend to use VS Code uh, or Sublime. I like both. Um, it doesn't really matter what you use. I mean, it's web-based, so if you really wanted to, you could even just use Notepad. It doesn't really matter. It's really based on what's going to help you the most. I like VS Code because it gives you lots of helpful hints. It makes it super easy to see what you're doing because you get syntax highlighting, stuff like that. It doesn't matter what you use, but what I would recommend if you're going to uh, code in PHP or any web-based language, use something that highlights your syntax for you. So you can easily tell what's a function, what's a variable, what's a string, right? Makes it a lot easier to tell. Uh, GitHub, we'll be dealing with that next week. Uh, don't worry about GitHub this week. Heroku will be dealing with in week six. Uh, my GitHub. So as we do code from week to week, I will push my code to GitHub uh, so you can actually access the code directly from there. And then the lesson plan application. So that lesson plan thing that we're looking at, uh, if you click on the lesson plan application, that will take you to the actual app itself. In there right now is two courses. Uh, this is the PHP course, but you can click on home and there's like a whole Mern stack course there as well, if you wanted to look at it. Right now, two of the lessons are up here. As I build the lessons on Friday, Saturday, uh, you'll see them add in here live. So you can actually see those lessons as they're being created, because I use my editor to be able to actually build them. Um, but yeah, so you can always access what you need to access directly in here. You just click on the course name that you want to take a look at. I'll log out so it looks the same as yours. 
and it looked like this. All you do is just click on the the class that you want to look at, and there you go. There's class one. You introduce into PHP. <laughs> cool. So if you want to go ahead and make sure you've got that open, because the links we need to access are in this page, and we're going to be right here where it's our tools and resources. So the first tool we're going to install is going to basically give us our development environment. So in order to do web development, you require a few different pieces. Um, you require, at the very minimum, a server. Something to basically take our content and serve it to the outside world, right? Only we're actually going to do something called local development, which is really us kind of mimicking that whole idea. We're going to take our server and deliver something to our own selves, right, within our own internal computer. But the concept is still the same. Basically what it will do is give us an address that we can access inside our browser, and then we can actually see our rendered code within the browser. That's the idea. Setting up a server can be kind of complex. Um, the server we're going to be using is called Apache. There are several different types, like Nginx. There's node servers, there's tons of different types of servers that you can actually use, Unicorn, Puma, a whole bunch of them. Um, Apache is probably one of the most common for PHP, or, or Nginx, one of the two. Uh, XAMPP will make this super easy for us because it will give us a web server right out of the box. Uh, we don't need to do any setup for it, which is super cool. The PHP binary, we need that in order to parse our PHP. What will happen is Apache will actually take a look at our PHP code, recognize that it ends in a PHP extension, and then it needs something to go through that code and interpret it, right? So we have to give it the binary that it requires, so it needs a PHP binary, because that's the code we're using. If we're using something else like Python, then it would need the Python binary, right? Ruby would need the Ruby binary. And then, this is optional, not for us, but it is optional. We're going to have a database with ours. We're going to use MySQL. Setting up MySQL and PHP and Apache raw on your system is time consuming. It requires downloading lots of or lots of uh, libraries. It's very, very hard to get set up on a local development machine if you don't know what you're doing. That's why XAMPP is fantastic because it gives you everything all in one cool little console. It runs out of the box makes things nice and easy for you, okay? So our first step is to actually install XAMPP. So if you click on the little link inside there, that'll take you to the XAMPP website. You can go ahead and, depending on which operating system you're using, just out of curiosity, how many Mac users are in here? There's three, two, two? Okay. So obviously, if you're on OS X, if you're in, in Mac, you're going to download that one. If you're in Windows, you're going to download the Windows version. If you're using Linux, is anybody brave and using Linux? <laughs> no? okay. Then don't download that. <laughs> now, the annoying thing about XAMPP, all three desktop applications look entirely different. So the Mac users does not look like the Windows users, and the Linux users do not look like the Windows users. Kind of annoying because I'm on a Mac. So I'm going to be using my Mac interface, which does not look like your Windows interface. They're very different. So what I want you to do is click on this, go through the install. You are going to hit an error. Some of you on your Windows machines, it's going to come up and say UAC is enabled. Just hit next, go on past it. It's totally fine. However, when it comes to launching it and it asks you to launch it, just say no because you're going to have to manually launch it by right-clicking on it and choosing to run for administrator. Okay, But we'll deal with that once you get to that point. So for right now, just download it and install it. That's what we want to do right now. Make sure you install for your correct operating system. Is yours running? Did it actually start to boot up? Yeah? Cool. You have little green dots? Nice. I should start mine because it takes forever to get up. Mm -hmm. 
This is what my XAMP interface looks like. This is not what your Windows one will look like. I will show you what your Windows one will look like. Your Windows one. That's super annoying. I miss the days when you used to be able to click on an image in Google and just have it open properly and not like this. Yeah. That's what the Windows version is going to look like once we actually download it. So, has anybody has theirs installed yet? Has it actually installed yet? Okay, so what I want you to do is just click start beside the patch and click start beside my site. Cool, it's a good sign, and then click start beside the patch. Awesome, we're good? Yeah. You can use web server if you're not comfortable. No, it's not that I'm comfortable. Oh, yeah, you have to Oh, so your MySQL class is done. You guys are using my uh, web server. That's fine. Yeah, don't bother. So. All right, so it, if your MySQL class has you using WAMP, just use WAMP. Don't bother starting up that thing or anything like that. Just use your WAMP server. Um, it doesn't really matter what we use as a server. It's just I use XAMP because it's cross-platform. Uh, but you can use WAMP if you want to use that instead. It might take a minute to figure out where you're supposed to put your documents though. <laughs> so once you have it downloaded and it's installed, and you want to start it up, what you would do is, uh, anybody on Windows 7? Good. So go to Cortana, a little search bar, type XAMP in the search bar. Actually, you won't be able to do that. I forgot, she doesn't show it up. You'll have to go through the file system. You're going to have to go to, it's going to go, I'll write it down. It's the only problem with having a Mac when most of you guys have, you're going to have to go to C, XAMP, okay? You're going to right click on, I think it's called Control Center. Does somebody have it? Is it called Control Center? Control Panel. You're going to right click on the Control Panel. And you're going to choose to run as administrator. That's important for some of you because what administrator does is it basically gives you global root access to your machine. So if anything requires permissions at the root level, you'll have them. But you need to run it as administrator to make sure that happens. <coughs> All right, so while we're waiting for all that to kind of go through, let's talk about IDEs. So we're going to skip past this part here. So like I said, I use VS Code. VS Code looks like this when you download it. This is VS Code. I like VS Code because it gives me... Um, Syntax highlighting, as you can see in here. So yeah, nice syntax highlighting. That's an HTML page in it, right? I find it very convenient to use. You don't have to use VS Code. There's also Sublime, which is totally fine. This is, looks like I opened this last semester. <laughs> that was the last time I opened that. In addition, though, you can use Atom. 
which is under adam.io, which uh, if you guys had Scott for HTML, this is one of his favorites. Um, there's a few different teachers that like Adam. Uh, and then there's also brackets. NetBeans, I don't recommend using NetBeans. It's a little too heavy for what we're doing. Uh, Visual Studio is like just a sledgehammer. There's no reason to use Visual Studio. You'll, you'll spend more time waiting for it to boot up than you will actually code. So just use something nice and light, like Adam, brackets, any of those guys. Sublime is perfectly fine. Yeah, exactly. I saw a hand up over here. Everything cool? Yeah, I'm coming. Help this guy in the Thank <laughs> you. 
Same way, run as administrator. If you have a block port, try restarting your computer and then run it again because sometimes what can happen is the port can get picked up by something else. If you have WAMP running, you will definitely get a block port because WAMP is currently taking that port address. So you need to close WAMP in order to make sure that you can access the port. Yes, it needs to be There you go, that's exactly what That's it? That's all? Yeah. Then we'll do some stuff. Running, running, cool. Thank <laughs> you. 
Because in Mac, I can just run which MySQL and it tells me where it's located. Uh, where? Where MySQL? Where space MySQL? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It doesn't matter, we don't need my sequel today. We just need a patch. All right. We just need a patchy today, so if my sequel is not running, not a big deal. We'll deal with my sequel when we actually start using it. Yeah, the patch is running, that's fine. Usually, what's going to cause my SQL issues is the way servers work is you have a port, right? So the server needs to be able to communicate through that port. How many of you took networking in semester one? All of you, right? All of you taking? All right. So remember the ports you learned about? In networking class, that's the exact ports we're talking about. Your computer communicates through ports, right? So the servers, they need some ports in order to be able to communicate to the outside world. And the two ports that we need free are 3306 for MySQL, because that's the port it wants to communicate across. And if it can't communicate across, it's going to crash. So there's a few ways around that. We can change the port number, right, which is totally doable. If we change the port number, it should boot up without issue. Or, which is likely the offender, <laughs> we can shut down WAMP. WAMP is likely the reason why it's doing that. So what may have happened is when you shut down WAMP, you exit it, but you didn't stop the services. So because the services are still technically running, MySQL is probably still running in the background. So the way around that would be to shut it down, like to actually stop all services, and then it would work. Uh, Apache is going to use port 8080, uh, which is, should be open. If it's not open, again, WAMP would likely be the issue of why it's not open. Today, we're only using Apache because we're only rendering PHP. We're not going to be doing any MySQL today. Uh, I usually wait to about the third week before we do MySQL, so you have a couple of MySQL classes under your belt. Because then, at least you understand how to select and create, hopefully by that point. It's kind of hard because we don't actually talk to the other instructors, so I have no idea where your MySQL teacher is going to be in week three, but hopefully they're there. Sometimes I'm a little bit faster than they are, but we'll see how it goes. Anyways, we don't need MySQL today, just Apache. So as long as Apache is running, you're A-OK. -okay. Even if you're just using WAMP to run Apache, it doesn't matter. We just need port 8080 open. <clears throat> so the next piece that we actually need to set up is where our files are going to go. What your server does, which is kind of interesting, think about it this way. You have a whole computer, right? And you've got directories after directories after directories and files after files after files on your computer. When you create a web server, and some people do run web servers locally on their home machines and literally just run it out to the real wide world, right, and actually run a web server and have people connect in. When you do that, obviously, you don't want people just rooting around your system looking at whatever files you have in there. You want to be able to restrict what they can actually see. So what XAMPP does is XAMPP creates a folder on your computer, so does WAMP, creates a folder on your computer that will be accessible from your internet browser, but only that folder. Anything above that folder is inaccessible. Anything outside of that folder is inaccessible. Only the folder itself is accessible, okay? In addition to that, only files that you put in that folder are accessible. So if you put an image in there, it's now available to your internet browser. <laughs> if you put a PDF in there, same deal, be available to the internet browser. Only files in that folder can be parsed. So if you put a PHP file in there, it can be parsed. If you put it outside that folder, it can't be parsed unless you change or modify Apache. XAMPP, when you install it, creates this folder in that XAMPP directory. Now, unfortunately, if you're using WAMP, I'm not sure where WAMP actually puts the files, but 
but it's probably similar. So to find your directory, this is a little annoying because it's different on Mac than it is in Windows. In Windows, you will find it under, I'm just going to open up this guy here, create a new doc. You're going to find it in C colon slash XAMP slash HT docs. That's where you're going to find the files that are actually deliverable to the internet for you. Okay, if you're on Windows. If you're on Mac, it's a little more annoying. <laughs> on the Mac, you have to tell it to mount the directory. So under the Volumes tab on your Mac, you will see a mount. You have to click Mount. It now becomes a directory that is available to you on your computer. And you will find it under CD, Opt, and LAMP. The cool thing is, is it also gives you an Explore button, which is super handy, because that will take you directly into the directory that you need to be in. Otherwise, it's exactly the same as Windows. You want the htdocs folder, which is right here. Okay? So, what I would like you to do in your file explorer is, if you're on Mac, navigate to htdocs. If you're in Windows, navigate to cxamp htdocs and open that folder in your file explorer. We're going to create some new folders in there. Don't delete any of the files in there. If you're on WAMP, Google is your friend. <laughs> Where do I put my files for WAMP? Uh, let's see. You're going to put your files in... Oh, that's super annoying. Uh, they go under your WAMP. They're going to go under your C WAMP www directory is where you're going to put those files. And Windows, or sorry, Mac will go under opt htdocs. <clears throat> so navigate to those in your finder, your file explorer, whatever it is that you're using, and open them up. Only do the WAMP one if you're running WAMP. If you're running XAMP, just do the top one. Okay. Once you get there, we're going to create some new directories. The first directory we're going to create will be called comp, so C-O-M-P, 10, 6, inside the HTD htdocs directory. So I'll do this in a nicely formatted way for you. Like that. Okay? So under the htdocs, you're going to create a comp 1006 file. Hold it. Okay? Anybody still creating that folder? Yeah? In there, create a new folder called Com 1006. Uh, in Windows, you can right click and choose to create a new folder. Uh, on Mac, I've totally forgotten. I think it's just Command Shift N will do it. <laughs> Command or Control Shift N will also work in Windows for creating a new folder. All right, so once you've done that, the next step is to jump over to Blackboard. And under the weekly lessons, under week one, Good news is once the setup's done, it's done. <laughs> we don't have to do it again. Uh, you will see lesson one starter files. What I would like you to do is click on that. They're going to download, right? And I want you to put them in that htdocs directory. So you're going to have to navigate there in your system to that directory. On Mac... What's interesting is when you mount inside this network tab here, you're going to see a link 
And that link that's 192 is actually that folder, that LAMP folder, if you're on a Mac. So it's kind of easy to get to where you need to go. Now I've got a comp 1006, but I need to actually change the name of my directory. You just leave yours the way it is. Save it in there. Once you saved it, extract it. So click on it so it extracts. So here it is. I'm going to extract it. Cool, it'll create a lesson one directory in the folder for you. And then you can remove the zip. I'm going to retitle my lesson one directory only because I have multiple classes. So I'm going to wind up with multiple lessons. While you're doing that, I'm going to explain to you, if you miss this class, I also teach at the exact same time in various classes around the school on Tuesday and Wednesday. If you want to attend one of the other classes, you just need to send me um, a message on Slack or through email. Some way notify me that you're going to be in that class the next week, okay? That is fine for regular lessons, not okay for midterms or finals, all right? So midterms or finals, you have to attend your class, right? If you need to switch your class to one of the other classes, you'll need to talk to your project or your um, program coordinator. That's who I'm thinking of, which is likely Ross, likely. All right, cool. Anybody have trouble creating or downloading? No? Awesome. So... If you look under that folder, you'll see some files in there now, right? We want to open this up inside our IDE. And there's different ways you can open them up in your IDE, but generally it's the exact same way. Either you can go to the IDE and choose to open, navigate to that folder and open it that way. But sometimes the easiest way to do it, at least for me, is I just drag the folder right over top of my IDE's icon, let go. Hold on, I... I waited too long, like so, and it opens a brand new IDE with the folder already open for me. Okay, that is one way. Otherwise, go to File, Open, Navigate to the folder, and open the entire folder in your IDE for yourself. All right, I'll walk you through the slow way as well, just so you know. So you're going to go to File, Open, Navigate to where that directory is. htdocs, comp1006, lesson one, and then don't click on a file, just click open, and the whole folder will open inside your uh, visuals, whatever you're using as a, an IDE. And it's usually the same for every single IDE. Just want to take a quick poll. How many of you are using Atom? Okay. How many of you are using Sublime? How many are you using VS Code? Okay, cool. How many are using NetBeans? Good. <laughs> All right. That's our tools. <laughs> We're like 90% of there, right? So obviously, the next step is to code some PHP, right? Might as well. I mean, that's why we're here, is to learn about PHP and web development in general, right? I have a whole thing about exploring the IDE, but there's no point in going over it. What I would recommend and what you're going to see me do, I use a lot of shortcuts in my IDE, but I always explain what those shortcuts are, like multiple cursors, uh, moving lines up and down, removing entire lines, stuff like that, because I code every day. I code for 10 hours, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and then I come here for three hours on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and code tomorrow. I love coding. So I've learned to use my IDE so that I can go quicker. What I would recommend doing is downloading a cheat sheet for your IDE that gives you quick keyboard shortcuts to do really cool, quick things that you're going to find yourself doing a lot, especially things like multiple cursors or duplicating lines or stuff like that, right? Those are common things you're going to wind up doing, so you're definitely going to want something that will allow you to do that. All right.
I think we'll do the same thing that I did with Wednesday's class. We will code a new index page, which will allow us to have links to the three pages that are currently there. You'll see a static page that's there that's already coded out. You'll see a dynamic PHP page that's not going to make a lot of sense. It's already coded out. And that's totally fine. And then we have this PHP syntax page that we're going to fill out next week. But what we're going to create is the index.php page, <coughs> which currently has text in it that's not going to make a lot of sense either. So what are we going to do? We're going to wipe it out. What I want you to do is open up the index.php, put your cursor anywhere on that page, hit Command A if you're on Mac, Control A if you're in Windows, locate the delete key on your keyboard, and hit delete. So that you wipe the file. Okay? And then save that so it's nice and blank. I feel like an HTML refresher is always helpful. Right? I mean, it's been, what, a whole two weeks since the last time you probably coded HTML? Or has it been longer than that? Did you code HTML in the first semester or the second semester? Okay, so it's been a while, right? It's been a while. Um, I don't always remember all of my HTML, and unfortunately I have a lot of cheating things that help me. But we'll see how I do here. Does anybody remember the first line of an HTML page that you absolutely have to have? What's that? Yep, the doc type. Somebody's drilled that into your heads for sure. Doc type HTML. Bam. That's the HTML5 doc type for us. I mean, we can get a little bit more crazy. We can add the language in there. We can add that it's UTF-8 coded. We can do tons of stuff. But the very bare minimum is that, right? The next piece, I mean, we need this as a tag or our thing doesn't validate. Exactly. HTML. Let's write our HTML tags. This is reminding me how painful this is and why I don't have auto-closing tags anymore. I need to re-enable auto-closing tags. So annoying having to write the closing tag. <laughs> HTML, that tells the browser, that says to the browser, hey browser, I'm an HTML page. And the browser says, I gotcha. I can, I can parse this. I understand the words that you're putting down. Right? That's what HTML does for our browser. So we need a head. We don't need lots in it. I mean, we could put metadata in it, but we're not going to. We're going to keep it nice, very clean, very simple. We're just going to put a title. Call it whatever you want. Doesn't really matter. <laughs> Does anybody know where this shows up? We can find it right now. Let's save that. Let's go to our favorite browser, right? Now, my favorite browser is Chrome. I like to use Chrome, and that'll be what I'll be using during the course. Some of you may use Safari, some of you may use Firefox. Shame on you if you use IE or Edge. <laughs> but I will be using Chrome. So I'm going to navigate over to Chrome. And I want to navigate to my page. And the easiest way to do that, the simplest way to do that, is HTTP colon slash slash. So that looks like this. HTTP colon slash slash. And what that stands for is Hypertext Transfer Protocol. That's what that stands for. And then I'm going to type in local host, like so. No port numbers, no colon anything, just HTTP local host. And I'm going to hit enter. And if everything is not working, this is what you will see. <laughs> if everything is working, you should see the XAMPP dashboard. port are you on if you're not? Oh, right. If you're on Mac, your life gets a little bit more annoying. <laughs> if you're in Windows, you can go to localhost. 
if you're on Mac, you have to go to the link they tell you, which is right here. But it's much easier if you just click on the Go to Application button. <laughs> you click on the Go to Application button, it'll take you right there. Sorry, Mac users. They don't do as much hand-holding for us, unfortunately. <laughs> now, obviously, this is not our page, right? This is the dashboard that XAMPP puts in. And I don't want you to delete this because it gives you nice handy links to things for you. Um, instead, we're going to go to our Comp 1006. And if you remember, if we look at our file structure, what you will notice is this folder called Dashboard. And if you look at your browser, what you will notice is this line called Dashboard. Those two are the same thing. This is the equivalence, the exact equivalence of doing C slash XAMPP slash htdocs. It's the exact same. There is no difference between that and what our server is doing for us right now. They are exactly the same thing. So that folder, what is happening right now is there's an index.html somewhere in this mess. Somewhere, not sure where. Uh, there it is, index.html. And Apache is kind of cool. Apache says, as long as you have an index.html or an index.php page, I won't make you type it in the address bar. I will just automatically go find it and render it for you. That's exactly what's happening. Our server is taking this file and sending it to our browser. And our browser is rendering that file. And we know that because see all this wonderful pretty colors and the logo and all that? If you right click on that and choose to view your page source, there's HTML, right? That's what the server sent to the browser. The server sent this. And the browser said, nobody can read that. I'm going to make that look pretty. So it converted it, right? Convert it into something that you would understand as a user, which is this. Okay? <laughs> so that's the dashboard, but we don't want the dashboard. We want into our folder. And you'll notice our folder is a sibling of this folder, right? They're both in the same line. So all we need to do is change dashboard with comp 1006 and hit enter. Apache is really friendly, and it does stuff like this for us. It gives us almost like an intermediary file explorer, right? It basically says, hey, I didn't see any index.html files, saw no index.php files, but I'll do you a solid, and I'll render the directories that exist, right? When we're running this live to the internet, we shut that stuff off. We don't want that to happen. We would much rather an error than showing people where our directory structure is. Right? But for us, we can actually use that to our convenience, click on our Lesson 1 folder, and it will take us to our page. Now, we have an index.php page in there. right? So if you get a blank screen, congratulations, PHP is working. If you don't get a blank screen and you get an issue or there's an error, then, uh-oh, PHP is not working for you. But we can do one step further, just to make sure. The thing I wanted to point out, after I close some of these links off, so that you can actually see my header up here, is you can see the title of my page that I typed in my head shows up in my tab. That's where that title shows up in HTML. And that's important for search engine optimization purposes, because that's what Google uses to index your page, is that title. All right. Let's type a very tiny, tiny piece of PHP that everybody learns when they first learn PHP. And that's the PHP info tag. And what the PHP info function does for us is it tells us what version of PHP we're using, what modules we have loaded, a whole bunch of garbly gook. But the biggest thing it tells us is that our PHP binary is working. Okay, So let's do that. So First, we're going to use tags to basically tell the interpreter that this next piece is PHP. And they look like this. 
Those are our tags with a nice little space in between. And you can put them on separated lines, like so. The top one is the opening tag, the bottom one is the closing tag. This opens PHP, this closes PHP. What Apache is going to do is it's going to come through here and it's going to be like, cool, that's HTML, I don't care about that. Oh, PHP tags. That's some parsing to do. Then it's going to read in here and it's going to parse whatever data is inside there. Go ahead and put your cursor in between those tags. Oh, I just realized my theme's not turned on. My theme is off. Give me one second. I like my theme. My theme is awesome. It's Synthwave. See how it all glows? I love it. It's the best thing. Of course, it always gives me that everything is corrupt. All right, let's try this out. We're going to type a function. You guys have done functions before, I'm assuming, right? You've done a function call before, right? It's the name of the function, which is known as a symbol name. doesn't matter what language you're working in. They're all the same. They all are called symbol names. Variables are symbol names. Functions are symbol names. Classes are symbol names. They're all symbol names. With a set of parentheses that indicates that it's a function call. And PHP is a semicolon delimited language, which means... We terminate a statement with a semicolon. No JavaScript whimsical semicolon if I want to or not. You have to use a semicolon. That terminates the statement. Go ahead and save that. All right, so now we've got PHP info. Jump over to your browser. Hit refresh on that page. And you're going to see all the PHP information that's going on. As long as you are version 7 plus, so 7.1, 7.3, I don't care, that's fine. If you're in version 5, you're going to have some issues because some of the stuff we're going to be doing won't work for you. So if you're in version 5, please see me after class and we will change it over to, for version 7 so that you can actually have a working copy of version 7. Um, yeah. So hopefully you have this page. Let's jump back to our IDE. <coughs> and you can keep that there if you want. If you want this piece and you don't want to lose it, we can comment it out, right? I mean, that's a programmer's dream, being able to comment out code that they might come back to at some point, right? Just put your cursor in front of it. Commenting is super easy. I think it's the exact same in Java. Slash, slash, comments out that line of code. I don't code in Java. Is Java slash, slash to comment out, or is it hashtags? Slash, slash, okay. Ruby's hashtags. <coughs> cool. That code is now commented out. If you jump over to your browser and refresh your page, you'll see that it's disappeared, right? Because it's been commented out. Cool. Uh, why don't we take 10 minutes, chill out for 10 minutes, and then we'll come back to this, we'll code our index page, and hopefully be done by like 9.30, 9.30, 9.35. Um, Alright, let's uh, meet back here at 9.12. Cool? Alright, so what we're going to do is create like a simple list for a navigation, but we'll create a couple of headers as well. Um, the headers we use basically just so that we can tell the user when they hit the page what something is, right? So the first header, we need to create a body tag. So let's go ahead and we'll wrap a body tag around this, like so. And we'll tab this PHP code inside. There we go. So now our body tag is wrapping our PHP block. Need a body tag to properly show our content. Let's put our cursor after the body tag, hit enter a couple of times, tab ourselves in so we're on a nice line, nice fresh line. And the first thing we'll do is create a proper HTML5 header, right? So we'll actually use the header element, right? That tells HTML, or that tells Google that this is a header. 
And then we'll put an H1 tag in there. So we have an H1 on the page. And we'll just write table of contents or whatever you want to write. <coughs> it doesn't really matter. After our header, I want to wrap this PHP block in an HTML block. And there's like a few different block elements I can use, right? Like I could use section, I could use div, I could use article. But these things do have meaning. They have uh, something known as semantic meaning. Um, so the one I'm going to use is section, which basically says this is a new section. There's a lot of different ways we could actually list our table of contents. There's tons of different ways we could do it. I kind of prefer an unordered list, right? Or even an ordered list, doesn't really matter which. Um, the difference between them is the tag we open it with. So a UL tag is an unordered list, which will give you like the little dots, right? And an OL tag will give you numbers, one to whatever you do, right? And that's an OL tag. So I don't know, I guess table of contents usually numbers them, so why don't we number them? We'll do an OL tag, and again, we're just wrapping our PHP with this. <coughs> there we go, and we'll tab it in so it's actually a child of section. Worst thing about colds is you wake up fine, and then as the day progresses, you slowly get worse, and it's so annoying. <coughs> All right. So we have our OL tag, right? I'm going to tie my PHP tag in a bit. Now, I love programming because I'm a super lazy person, and I hate doing things that are redundant. I don't want to have to type out four OL tags because that's silly. Why would I do that, right? When I can use programming to spit out four OL tags for me, and there's no reason for me to have to type out four of them, right? I only need to type one, one OL tag, right? But in order to do that, I need to create some info so that I can populate my OL tags. So the first piece of PHP we're going to learn is a variable, right? We're going to do this nice and slow next week, but for today, we're going to learn a whole bunch of different things really, really fast. And maybe they won't make a total lot of sense, but that's totally fine. I'm going to put that PHP thing down towards the bottom there. And I'm going to create a variable. And the way we signify a variable in PHP is with a dollar sign. And the thing that you're first going to notice, no data types. Not one. You don't tell it it's going to be a string. You don't tell it it's going to be an integer or a boolean or anything else. Because PHP is known as a loose type language. Or some people say it's a duck type language. Duck type means if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it must be a duck, right? Same kind of applies to PHP. If it looks like a string, smells like a string, probably a string, right? Same with a boolean. Looks like a boolean, acts like a boolean, it's likely a boolean. So PHP will implicitly decide what your data type is so you don't need to define it. You just write your variable and give it a value. That's it. Nice and easy. Very quick to code in PHP because you don't need to set those data types. So to create our first variable, we're going to create a variable called items. And I want to make it equal to an array, right? And there's a few different ways to define arrays in PHP, but we're going to use the nice shorthand version. I'm going to say you're equal to an array. Set of square brackets. Square brackets signifies that this is an array. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing about PHP versus, say, something like Java, in Java you have dictionaries and you have lists, right? And lists, if I'm correct, are basically like an array, except for the indexes being zero to whatever, you can actually give them names, right? You can give each of your indexes names. In PHP, 
Arrays are always lists. They're always lists. They never change. They always act the same way. Index numbers on a PHP do start from zero on an array, right? They just start from zero and go to whatever. However, that number is actually just a key. That's all it is. And it's just something that PHP creates automatically. It doesn't have to be a key, though. You can change it to, like, name or age or whatever the heck you want to call it. It doesn't matter. So that's one of the first, probably, I don't know, some people love them and some people absolutely hate them because they're not a different structure than a hash or a list, right? The arrays and hashes and lists are all the same thing in PHP. So we're going to take advantage of that. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the path name that we need to create for our link, our href, right, as our key and the title that we want to call for our path as the value. And the way that's going to look, let's move those down so that the closing square bracket is on the next line. <clears throat> and we're going to add in our key. Our key is going to be these file names. So each of these file names will be our keys. So why don't we create home first, right? So home will be index.php will be the key, okay? Because that's the name of the file. And to denote that this is a key, we use something called a hash rocket, which looks like an equal sign and a greater than sign. It's an arrow. It's an arrow pointing at the thing that's going to be the value, right? And the value is whatever you want to call it. I'm going to call mine home. Does that make sense to me? So that's our first list item, right? There's our key, and there's our home. Title. All right, let's create another one. Press comma to denote that this is a list item. This is the first item, and it's going to be followed by another item. All right. The next item, let's do static.html. So again, I'm just naming this after the file names that you see on the left-hand side. I'm going to use a hash rocket, and I'm going to say static web page for that one. Because that's what it is. I'm not sure if you looked at it. The recipes for grilled cheese sandwiches, which you guys should probably know how to make anyways. But that's the title I'm going to use. For the third one, I'm sure by this point you're experts at this. Dynamic.php points to dynamic web page. And then last but not least, Let's do the PHP syntax one. So PHP dash syntax dot PHP. And we'll just make it equal to PHP syntax. There we go. Four items. We have four items. Nine thirty. Uh, let's rocket through this a little bit. What I want to do now is take my items that I've defined here and I want to iterate through them, right? So I want to create a loop, loop through my items and create li tags with an anchor length where the href is equal to the key and the name is equal to the uh, value. And it might sound complex, but it's not really. What I'm going to do is I'm going to step out of my PHP like so. And I'm going to show an example of how we can actually use PHP almost as a template language. So we have HTML, and I can step in and out of PHP as much as I want. All I need to do is denote it with these blocks. That's it. Right? And what's cool is PHP actually gives us some kind of different syntax to use 
when we're doing that so it looks a little cleaner. The piece of syntax we're going to use is a loop that's actually made for arrays or lists or hashes or whatever you want to call them. But it's made for these particular things. It's made to iterate over these. And what it looks like, PHP, let's just draw our opening and closing tag, but we'll leave them on the same line. The name of the iterator is called for each. And it has a set of parentheses. And it's technically a block syntax, right? So if you were to write this normally, there'd be a set of curly braces at the end of this, and you would write your code inside the block. But because we want to write this in line with our HTML, what we can actually do is terminate it with a colon, not a semicolon, a colon. The colon are two dots. That's what a colon is. Okay. Then all we have to make sure we do somewhere in our HTML after that, that we close it. And the way we close it, draw another set of PHP tags, write n for each, and a closing PHP tag. That's what that looks like. Now, anything we want to actually do repetitively, we will put in between these two things. Don't worry if you're slightly lost, that's totally fine. Next week we're going to be doing PHP syntax and we're going to take it nice and slow from the top. Comments, variables, conditionals, repetition structures, functions, everything nice and slow. Let's create a gap between these two lines, put ourselves in between the middle of them. Like I said, anything we want to repeat, we're going to put in here, right? But before we do that, for each, take some arguments. We need to give for each some arguments. And the arguments we need to give it, the array or hash or list or whatever it is that we want to repeat through, and how we want to deal with that. It's throwaway variable that we want to work with. The nice thing in PHP is you can actually get away with pulling the key out as well as the value into their own separated var variables. And the way we do that is we name the array, items, right? So we have our items at the top there. So the first value we give it is the array name. Then we use the keyword as. And what this basically says is for each items as whatever throwaway variable you want to use. If you leave it there and stop and just continue on, it will go through all of these and it will spit the value into whatever the variable name is put here. So we don't want just the value, we want the key as well. So the way we get both of them is we basically write almost the same syntax pattern that we used in our list. So we're going to do key and value. Now the cool thing is, this is a variable that you've already defined as an array. That, you can't change the name. That has to be whatever you told it up there. But these two, totally your choice. I'm using key and value, but you don't need to use key and value, right? Like, I mean, look at your data. Your data doesn't really correspond to key and value. Your data corresponds more to path and title. That makes more sense to me. So what I like to do when I'm writing those type of things, I don't use key and value. I call it what it is, right? So that way it's easy for me to remember when I'm writing my code what data I'm actually working with. So I change key over to path and I change value to title because those make more sense to me. They actually correspond properly to what data is actually inside my array. So here's what's going to happen. It's going to go through and it's going to grab the first item in our list, which is that indexed, I think it's index. Yeah, it's index. So it's going to grab index.php with the value of home. It's going to grab that line and it's going to take index.php and store it in the path variable. And then it's going to take home and store it in the title variable. And then it's going to pass it into our block inside 
this wonderful space we have inside here. And those variables now become available to us and we can use them in our code. Then it's going to exit out, come back through the loop and go back through again. And this time it's going to assign static.html to our path. And then it's going to assign static web page to our title. And it's going to keep doing that till it reaches the end of the list. Once it's done the list, it will exit the loop and continue parsing our HTML. That's what it does. So to get it to do all of this, we want to put something in the middle, something for it to work with, something to iterate over. <clears throat> and this is where it makes sense to do the li tag. So we're going to have li. And notice I'm just writing raw HTML because I'm out of the PHP. I ended my PHP here. I started my new PHP here and ended it here. So in here, I'm in HTML. Doesn't matter. It's still going to create four li tags for me right now. They'll be empty because there's nothing in them, but we'll have four li tags. <clears throat> I'm going to move my li tags apart and properly nest my anchor link inside of it. Here's my anchor link. And this is where we learn how to take a PHP value and spit it out as raw text to our screen, right? We're going to use a function that PHP has called echo. And there's two ways we can write this. We can write it using the actual word echo, or we can do the shorthand. Let's write it the long way first so that you fully understand what echo looks like. We write a set of PHP tags, just like we would normally. And then in the middle, I'm just going to collapse my sidebar just because this is going to get quite lengthy. In the middle, we write our function name, which is echo. And echo you can write with a set of brackets because it is a function. However, you don't have to because the interpreter implicitly knows how echo works. We give it its value. So we're between our A tags. We just want our title here. So all we need to do is echo, dollar sign, title, and end it with a semicolon. <coughs> so what will happen is as it iterates, it will build the anchor link. It will take whatever the title is, so the first time will be home, and this will become home. It will fill this in, it will replace this text you see here with the word home. Next time will be static. Uh, web page, third time will be dynamic web page, and then PHP syntax. But we want these to be linked, right? So we need an href so that we can actually link it off somewhere. <coughs> so if you put your cursor next to your A, the opening A tag, hit space and type href, we still have to abide by proper HTML syntax. So proper HTML syntax looks like this, equals with a set of quote characters. Okay? That's cool. We have the quote characters. Yay. The problem is, is we want our link, our dynamic link that's in PHP inside these quote characters. Might seem like a problem, but all we need to do is just write our PHP the same way we've been doing it. PHP just between the quote characters, echo, dollar sign path, semicolon. Super simple. Now you're probably looking at this going, Sean, PHP echo path, like how many times am I going to write that during the course of your course? I'll give you that answer. You will write that probably 5,000 times. You're going to write PHP echo blah. You're going to do it so many times, you're going to be like, there has to be an easier way. And there is. PHP 7 introduced the shorthand echo statement. The shorthand inline echo statement. And this thing is fantastic. We get to drop PHP, we get to drop the word echo, and we get to add an equal sign, and it means exactly the same thing. What that looks like, bam, bam. But it gets even better. Because this statement terminates automatically the second it hits this, we don't need the semicolon. So you get, get rid of those too. Goodbye. 
Sayonara. And that is the same statement in a much condensed format. Go ahead and save that. <laughs> Everything is good. If we are closing tags are there. Look over this code. Make sure you use the colon here and not a semicolon. Make sure you close these with the greater than symbol and the question mark. Look at the syntax, right? I have more students tell me, oh, your code's broken. And it's not me, it's you. It's always you. <laughs> it's not your computer. <laughs> All right, jump over to your Chrome browser, Firefox browser, UG Edge, UG IE. Refresh and marvel at your smartness as you see your four dynamic links that you created on the fly using your wonderful lazy programming, right? If you hover over them, you can see the link in the status bar at the bottom of your page. It should show up under the status bar. You should see local hosts, right? Comp 1006, lesson one, index.php for the first one, and all the rest of them. You should be able to click on them, right? You click on home, goes nowhere because it is the home page. Click on static web page, you'll see the wonderful grilled cheese recipe. Go home tonight, make that. It's good, it's yummy. Dynamic web page looks exactly the same, but what I would recommend doing is actually looking at the code between the two. They are very different. And then the last link at the very bottom, the PHP syntax link, that's what we're going to be doing next week. We're going to go through each one of these and fill these out, and it's going to become your PHP syntax cheat sheet that you guys can bring into your test. So make sure you do that, because that's one of the documents you will be allowed in your midterm. Anyways, that's it. That's all I've got. It's 9.41. I mean, we tried to make it to 9.30, but we didn't. 9.41 is a little early. Um, next week we'll be doing PHP syntax. Uh, don't forget there is a quiz. So this quiz, can I just get your attention for one second just so I can give you the password and you don't miss it? The quiz is password. Super secure. Very difficult password, so make sure you pay attention closely. The quiz's password is... <laughs> There you go. <laughs> you have till tomorrow. Yeah, that's a W. Or should be. <laughs> All right, cool. I will post this video.